the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Bunya al-Islamu ala khams, shahadati an la ilaha illa Allah, wa anna muhammadan rasulullah, wa iqam salati wa ita'i zakati wal hajji wa sawmi ramadan. Islam is built upon five pillars, testifying that there is no deity but Allah and that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, establishing the prayer, paying the alms, pilgrimage to the house, and fasting the month of Ramadan. This hadith is similar to the hadith of Jibreel we partially cited in a previous lesson. That hadith actually had the angel first asking, Ya Muhammad, akhbirni anil Islam. O Muhammad, tell me about Islam. The Prophet wasallam replied, Al-Islamu an tashhadu an la ilaha illa Allah, wa anna Muhammadan Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa tuqimu salata wa tutti al-zakata wa tasawma ramadana wa tahajj al-bayt in istatata alayhi sabila. Islam is that you testify that there is no deity but Allah, and that Muhammad is a messenger of Allah, and you establish prayer, and pay zakat, and observe the fast of Ramadan, and perform pilgrimage to the house, the Kaaba, if you can bear the journey. Each of the five pillars intrinsically encourages scientific endeavor at the level of communal obligation, starting with the first pillar, the Shahada, the witnessing of faith. For the sake of brevity, we translate the testimony La ilaha illallah as There is no ilah, no deity or God, except Allah. For some, their ilah, their God, is a named deity, such as Odin, Vishnu, or Buddha, or some other deified being from a particular defined religion or mythology. For others, their ilah could be a celestial object in which they place their trust and faith, like the sun or the moon, or an earthly object such as a particular rock or river. A person's ilah could be another human being to whom they ascribe holiness or infallibility, such as so-called holy men or saints, or animals like a cow. Likewise, any person or thing that is prayed to or called upon from afar, such an object of devotion is an ilah. A person could also take an abstract idea or theory as an ilah, even their own whims and desires. <laughs> Have you seen him who takes his own vain desires as his ilah, as his god? In short, anything that is worshipped besides Allah, or that is given Allah's due rights, becomes an ilah a deity or God. And there are many thousands if not millions of such gods, but they are all false gods, besides the one true God, Allah, who is therefore alone worthy of worship. This is why the actual meaning of La ilaha illallah becomes there is nothing worshipped in truth except Allah, or none has the right to be worshipped except Allah. To bear witness to this freely and sincerely, that none is worthy of worship except Allah, and that Muhammad is his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this affirms a person's faith in Islam. That faith is then evidenced with one's limbs by serving and worshipping Allah in the way of his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Shahid Allah annahu la ilaha illa huwa wal malaikatu wa ulul ilmi qa'iman bil لا إله إلا هو العزيز الحكيم. Allah gives witness that none is worthy of worship but He, as do the angels and those with knowledge, maintaining His creation with justice. There is no deity but He, the Mighty, the Wise. And what do we mean by worship? In Islam, worship is an all embracing concept, which, as well as ritual acts like prayer, encompasses all goodness, decency and devotion expressed through obedience, sacrifice or humility. Any feeling, speech or action that emanates from a genuine love, hope or fear of Allah, sincerely seeking His pleasure and adhering to the Sunnah, constitutes worship in Islam. The mathematician's calculation, the scientist's experiment, the laborer's labor, the farmer's tilling the land, the parents' raising of their children, the child's dutifulness to its parents, the general's command and the soldier's march, any and all such acts that the Muslim does, no matter how menial or mundane, how routine or rational, provided that they are done seeking Allah's pleasure, 
than their acts of worship. Say, truly my prayer, my sacrifice, my life and my death are all for Allah, Lord of the worlds. The need to facilitate the worship of Allah in strict monotheism, Tawheed, and to facilitate obedience to him through establishing the sunnah of his messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in society, is a current that runs through practically all scientific works from Islam's classical period. Take the example of the polymath Al-Biruni, a native of Khwarizm and one of the greatest scientists to have ever lived. In the introduction to one of his books, Biruni glorifies Allah, hoping to have his effort honoured amongst the works of other scholars in the service of the religion. It is from the innumerable favours of Allah, the Most High, that he sustains his creation with what is of advantage for them. He has dignified all of his creation with his bounties, foremost of which is that he has never left a period of time without a righteous and upright scholar, someone who acts as a shield of protection for his creation. Truly by the scholar's obedience to Allah, the glorified, and to his messenger, Muhammad, he is able to speak the truth with justice. His statements are jurisdictive and principled. Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu ati'u Allah wa ati'u rasoola wa ulil amri minkum. O you who believe, obey Allah and obey the messenger and those of you who are in authority. In fact, one struggles to find a scientific work from the first millennium of Islam which did not pen such generous praise of Allah alongside copious citations from the Quran while sending salutations of peace upon his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. These prayers were invoked so unsparingly that, were it not for illustrative diagrams, one would be excused for confusing the works of natural scientists on medicine, mathematics, astronomy and engineering with purely religious works on aqidah, tafsir, fiqh and hadith. Indeed, a number of scholars were equally proficient and just as renowned in theology as they were in science. Take for example Ibn al-Nafis, who is a great authority as a physician than Avicenna. Avicenna's magnum opus, the canon of medicine, was the standard textbook taught in Christian Europe for over 600 years, as late as 1650 in fact. Ibn al-Nafis critiqued and corrected the canon greatly and was regarded in his day to have surpassed Avicenna. Therefore, Ibn Nafis is more deserving of the title, the father of modern medicine. But he was also an Islamic scholar of the Shafi Madhab, specializing in Usul al-Fiqh, the foundational principles of jurisprudence. And whilst Avicenna is said to have died prematurely due to alcohol consumption, when it was the turn of the pious Ibn Nafis to journey onto the afterlife, while slain on his deathbed, his fellow physicians offered him medicine mixed with alcohol to relieve him of his illness and pain. Ibn Nafis responded, I do not want to meet Allah, the Most High, whilst I have alcohol in my stomach. The second pillar of Islam, the most important act of ritual worship, of manifesting one's servitude to Allah, is the five times a day prayer. Recite what has been revealed to you of the book and perform the prayer. Verily the prayer prevents from indecent and evil deeds and the remembering of Allah is greater indeed and Allah knows what you do. The prayer ensures that throughout the rhythm of the day at dawn, noon, mid-afternoon, dusk and nightfall a direct link is maintained between the believer and God. The prayer takes only a few minutes to perform and engages the mind, body and soul of the worshippers as they stand, bow, kneel and prostrate before their Lord whilst glorifying and praising him and asking his pardon, forgiveness and guidance. As Islam has no religious hierarchy or priesthood, any worthy Muslim nominated by his congregation can lead them in prayer. يا أيها الذين آمنوا استعينوا بالصبر والصلاة. Or you who believe, seek help in patience and prayer. The daily prayer's timings are taken from the solar cycle. Consequently, Muslims had to be proficient in measuring time wherever they were and know the direction of prayer, Makkah, 
relative to wherever they were. This was achieved through mapping the sky at night and studying its celestial bodies. Muslim scholars, that is, Muslim theologians, strove for excellence and expertise in astronomy as if it were a branch of religious learning. Simultaneously, in maintaining Tawheed, they debased the shirk of astrology, which was a universal practice and remained so almost everywhere outside the Islamic world. As the daily prayer was to be prayed in congregation, architectural and engineering know-how was needed to construct increasingly large mosques that could accommodate the ever-growing numbers of worshippers. Ritual ablution, wudu, with clean running water is a prerequisite for ritual prayer. Managing and maintaining a fresh water supply that could be routed to a mosque's courtyard, as well as for irrigation in general, was also engineered very early on. There are mosques from the first century of Islam which still have functional fountains from where the worshippers continue to take refreshing gulps of water and make their ablutions. It is perhaps a peculiar feature and a great achievement of Islamic civilization that, although much of the early Islamic homeland is arid, Muslims living there would wash frequently throughout the day in a way that societies in Europe with high precipitation just would not and could not do. All this was due to clever hydro-engineering. Due to the prohibition on graven images and human portrait, geometry was developed to decorate mosques, public and private buildings, books and ornaments. Horticulture was also practiced to decorate courtyards and plazas, which were kept void of statues and religious icons. Again, these advances were inspired by a jealously monotheistic culture of God-consciousness that kept the masses protected from the offensive art forms of shirk that were and remain so prevalent in public spaces of non-Muslim societies. The third pillar of Islam is zakah, the poor due, the small alms charitable tax that is levied on superfluous wealth in order to be redistributed amongst the poor and needy. <laughs> Charity is only for the needy and the poor, and those employed to collect it, and to attract the hearts of those inclined towards Islam, and to free the captives, and to relieve those in debt and for Allah's cause, and for the wayfarer, a duty imposed by Allah, and Allah is all-knowing, all-wise. Islam teaches that everything belongs to Allah, and wealth is held in trust by humans. Zakah means purity, and one's capital savings are purified by setting aside around one-fortieth for those in need. This charitable redistribution of wealth effectively eradicated poverty in early Islamic society and, given the opportunity, could do so again. And such of you as believe and spend in Allah's way, theirs will be a great reward. Islam's humane financial system revolves around this usury free institution. Zakat and other tax collections and registers, inheritance, salaries and stipends. Mathematics was needed to calculate them all, to accurately confer upon people their rights and to balance the books. The development of Arabic numerals to represent each digit of the decimal system with a single character, something we take for granted today, was a key component of the Muslims' early mastery of mathematics. Khwarizmi is another polymath who could justify his entry in the shortlist of the greatest scientists who have ever lived. In his masterpiece, the title of which is from where the term algebra is taken, he wrote, I have authored this book entitled al Jabr wal Muqabila, invested to serve the gentle one, the reckoner. Glory be to him, as he is the one who has ordained for man a need for mathematics in their daily lives, from laws of inheritance, bequeaths, measurements and laws in jurisprudence and trade. Likewise, there resides a great need of mathematics for man in all of their architectural and manufactural developments. This all extends in a broader range of engineering and disciplines. Commencing this work with the most noble of intentions, hoping that the scholars of expertise in this field are given the due credit that Allah, the Blessed and the High, has entrusted unto them from His protruding favours upon them and the most preferring of bounties. 
So in Allah is my success in this and all of my other works. Upon him I trust and he is the Lord of the mighty throne. Whilst the prayer revolves around the sun, the religious holidays of Islam revolve around the moon. Ramadan and Hajj, the fourth and fifth pillars of Islam respectively, are both lunar calendar events. Each year, during the Islamic lunar month of Ramadan, Muslims abstain from food, drink and sexual relations from dawn till dusk. Fasting teaches self-restraint and God-consciousness. It also helps Muslims improve their health and empathize with those less fortunate. يا أيها الذين آمنوا كتب عليكم الصيام كما كتب على الذين من قبلكم لعلكم تتقون. O you who believe, fasting has been prescribed for you as it was prescribed for those before you, that you may become pious. Pilgrimage to the Kaaba, the cube-shaped shrine in Mecca, is an obligation for those who are physically and financially able. Clad in simple garments that strip away all social distinctions, millions gather in Makkah to perform Hajj rites that go back to the Prophet Abraham. The pilgrims return home with their spirits high, their lives refocused, their faith rejuvenated and strengthened, and their past sins forgiven. <laughs> And Hajj to the house is a duty that mankind owes Allah, those who are able. So again, astronomy fulfilled a very real practical need. Al-Battani, another great scholar from Islam's classical period, wrote, From the most prestigious of sciences, from the eldest in chronological order, from the studies that bring about the most amount of joy and intellect to the heart, and that which gives most fuel to provoke in thought in refining senses that no human can do without, after the virtue and benefits found in the knowledge of the Sharia and of the Sunnah of the Prophet, is the benefit found in the knowledge of astronomy. Batani continued after mentioning some of what astronomical sciences entail, By this, the greatest stimulation for contemplation and a continual source of reflection in affirming the Tawheed of Allah and gaining knowledge of Him, is evident here as He is the sublime Creator, infinite in wisdom, revered in His ability, perfect in attention to detail. As he, the most honorable of those who speak, said, Verily in the creation of the heavens and the earth, and in the alternation of night and day, there are indeed signs for those of understanding. And the glorified and the exalted said, هو الذي جعل الشمس ضياء والقمر نورا وقدره منازل لتعلموا عدد السنين والحساب. It is he who made the sun a shining thing and the moon as a light and measured out their stages that you may know the number of years and the reckoning. These hardly sound like men who did science in spite of their god and in spite of their religion. So we are in agreement with Harris for once, on the issue of Islam inspiring its followers to do science. Where we disagree, of course, is that this was no bad thing. Yes, there were Muslims making advances in optics, I think, and one often hears this, but they weren't using these advances to build telescopes and understand the cosmos. They were using them to design religious calendars and more accurately pinpoint the direction of Mecca. And thank God they did, for in seeking Allah's pleasure, Muslim scientists gave tremendous and lasting contributions that were of actual, practical benefit, not just to their own faith communities, but for humanity at large. The two things are not mutually exclusive. Whatever benefits Islam, benefits the world and all its inhabitants. <laughs>